Oops. Um, so my objectives for this uh, part of the talk are to go through some of the definitions of HP, uh, look at some of the proposed diagnostic criteria, and then review some uh, one of the prediction rules uh, for the diagnosis of acute and subacute forms of HP, and then go through uh, a new proposed model um, for the clinical diagnosis of chronic HP in the absence of surgical lung biopsy. Um, but we've kind of already talked about all this. I just wanted to call it the great imitator, because every other field has one, if it's MS or syphilis. I was like, I think in our field, like HP may be the great imitator of pulmonary medicine. Um, and in the, the chronic form of it is really challenging to differentiate between idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis and idiopathic NSIP. Um, so one of the early definitions uh, by Richardson in 1989 um, proposed that HP is an immunologically induced inflammation of the lung parenchyma resulting from repeated inhalation of etiologic agents, including organic dusts and chemicals. The diagnosis is established when the history of physical exam and PFTs indicate ILD. There's a consistent chest x-ray and an exposure to a recognized cause and that there's antibodies to that antigen. So in that sentence, there's a lot of implied um, sort of implications. So it was back, you know, sort of before HRCT was in widespread use, so relying on the chest x-ray. Uh, the requirement that you must have an identified antigen and that you have to have positive uh, antibodies to that antigen. And so that likely doesn't um, apply to all of our cases. Uh, they commented that biopsy was rarely indicated and that um, inhalational challenges for research purposes only and had no clinical rule. So in 2003, the HP study um, group proposed that it's a pulmonary disease with symptoms of dyspnea and cough resulting from the inhalation of an antigen to which the patient has been sensitized. And then in 2005, it's been you know, sort of I'd say this is probably the most um, accepted uh, definition. Uh, also known, used to be called extrinsic allergic alveolitis, complex health sy syndrome um, uh, with, uh, that's heterogeneous. It's the result of uh, your immune response to uh, inhalation to a large variety of antigens. So I'd say that's you know, uh, less concrete with them, um, but accurate. Uh, in 1997, these di diagnostic criteria were proposed, and so, um, you had to have, these were the major criteria, so symptoms, had the exposure history, um, compatible findings uh, radiographically, a lymphocytosis if it was done, histology had to be consistent if it was done, and then a positive natural challenge, and then minor criteria that were crackles, decreased DLCO, and then arterial uh, hypoxemia, either resting or exertional. And then the diagnosis was confirmed if you had four plus, four, four or more major and two or more minor, and you excluded other diseases. Um, and then in uh, another uh, set of uh, proposed diagnostic criteria from 1986, um, we're having an, an exposure history um, by history or serum precipitins, uh, symptoms consistent with HP that worsened hours after the exposure, therefore we're telling it this is probably acute and subacute, not applying to chronic, a compatible chest x-ray, and then these as additional criteria. So again, these were, HP was thought to be confirmed if you had all these main and then two plus additional criteria were met and you'd excluded other diseases. Um, but over time, things have changed, and we've moved so much. Uh, we don't rely on chest x-ray really anymore. I'd say in most uh, practices, you would go on to have a high-resolution CT scan of the chest. Um, this is kind of up for debate. Uh, I think in different parts of the world and in different practices, the use of serum precipitins uh, is still commonly applied. In a lot of large centers, uh, it's not used at all. Um, I don't even know how to order them in my ILD center. We'd have to send them out to the Mayo Clinic, and we have no idea if those have any relationship to the, our regional exposures. Um, we've now increasingly, increasingly recognized chronic HP, uh, which I think was probably thought to be, you know, some other form of fibrotic ILD in the past. We know that antigen identifi identification is not always possible. And then what's interesting about the prior proposed diagnostic criteria is they've never, the accuracy has never been tested. So no one's ever taken those criteria and prospectively applied them in cases of suspected HP and said, yes, this diagnosis with this number of specificity, which is really important. And so um, there's a you know, big difference between looking back and saying these are associated with the disease. That's helpful and, and interesting. Um, but a different way of looking at this is by the creation of clinical prediction models. Uh, and these are really tools that, that quantify and weight the contribution of various components. So whether it's a history of exposure, physical exam finding of something like crackles, certain findings on CT, and then, um, and then you know, serum precipitins being positive. If you combine all of those, um, what specificity uh, does that give you at the end of it in the cohort that you're studying? 
Um, so these rules are supposed to help us arrive at a more accurate estimate of probability and to decide whether or not you have to go on to things like surgical and biopsy. It's important to know that clinical prediction models, they're not diagnostic criteria. So nobody's saying you have to have every single thing that's in there. It's saying in combination, if you have these three out of the five or whatever, it will give you a certain um, probability. And that probability translates to a specificity, and that's how you apply it in clinical practice. Uh, so this is really one of my favorite HP papers of all time, the HP study back in 2003. Um, so uh, this, this was a large group of uh, you know, seven sites from seven countries. Um, they took adults with the pulmonary syndrome where HP was in the differential diagnosis. And they prospectively collected um, all sorts of data, clinical, physiologic, radiographic, bronchoscopic, and then histologic if they went on to have a biopsy. And they went on to have a biopsy if their treating physician thought it was necessary to make the diagnosis. And they derived and validated a clinical prediction rule for the diagnosis of HP. So to do this, you have to have a gold standard of what's the diagnosis. So you're comparing it to um, their diagnostic gold standard was the combination of a BAL lymphocytosis, so greater than a 30% in non or ex-smokers, or greater than or equal to 20% in never or in current smokers. And then on an HRCT having bilateral ground glass opacity and central lobular nodularity. So that's how they, and then excluding things you didn't have like rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, on amiodor or something like that. Um, but that was how they defined HP. So if these criteria were not met, they could undergo additional tests uh, like transbronchial biopsy or surgical lung biopsy. So, um, so they started with uh, 720, some were excluded. These people were included in the analysis. So if they had an alveolar lymphocytosis on BAL, yes. Then they had, did they have ground glass opacities in the CT that was diagnostic? Uh, yes. Um, then 164 um, of those patients were found to have HP. Uh, 98 controls uh, also had that, uh, but ended up not having a final diagnosis of HP based on other investigations. The, the, the ones I find interesting are the alveolar lymphocytosis on BAL. They did not have that, so they had low lymphocytes on BAL. They didn't have a characteristic CT. Um, of those, some were diagnosed with HP, but 142 were not, based on surgical lung biopsy or transbronchial biopsy. But of these, there's probably you know 70 people left who I can't exclude that they may have had chronic HP because these findings are not necessarily found on chronic HP. Um, and so this is, uh, of this cohort, the majority of people had bird exposures or were farmers, and they only had three um, out of all those patients with an unknown antigen. So not necessarily describing, certainly not the chronic cases. Um, but so individual predictors, so if you had an exposure to an offending antigen that had an odds ratio of like 40, so that's obviously very, was very important in this cohort. Positive precipitating antibodies were very important. And then uh, recurrent episodes of symptoms, inspiratory crackles, symptoms four to eight hours after exposure, and weight loss. And when you put them all together, so basically what they did here is took all of those variables and said if you have any combination of them, what's your probability of having HP? So if you have crackles, positive serum precipitins, and all of those positive, there's a 98% probability you have HP. So nobody would go on to biopsy that person. 98% is pretty good, I think, in any medical diagnosis. Um, but you can look at all the, you know, these other varying. You don't have an exposure. You don't have recurrent symptoms. You don't have any of these. But you have crackles and a positive serum precipitins. It's a 3% chance that you have HP, so you should probably go look for an alternative uh, explanation for their um, ILD. Um, some of the limitations, so in the non-HP study group, you didn't have to have a final diagnosis as long as you didn't have a lymphocytosis and you didn't have those findings on HRCT. So I wonder if those people still could have had chronic HP. I don't know. But then, And then um, you can't include the, the BAL and the HRCT in the prediction models because that's how they diagnosed it. So you'd have this circular argument. But they basically said the predictors of disease we identified do not apply to chronic and inactive forms of the disease. They do, however, very well apply to acute and subacute forms, particularly if you have an identified antigen. Um, oh yeah, so this um, so this study by Vrlikas et al. Uh, out of National Jewish in Denver in 2004, they looked at cases of chronic HP, um, and they looked at um, they're basically looking at uh, predictors of mortality. One of my the interesting things that came out of this um, was that the percent lymphocytes, so the total lymphocytes and the percent lymphocytes in the BAL are significantly lower in fibrotic than non-fibrotic ILD. Um, and, and just as um, Andrew had said earlier, the CD4 to CD8 ratios were actually quite elevated. Um, so the BAL lymphocytosis 
The data supporting that, uh, the published data supporting that are scarce, uh, not scarce, I'd say sort of small studies, very old. I think in clinical practice, we see that if you have a really high lymphocytosis and we suspect you have HP, then it certainly contributes to the diagnosis, but it's not been rigorously studied as to what that adds to a diagnostic model and to your confidence of a diagnosis. So certainly in chronic HP, I think there's a, a lot of question. Um, so this is a proposed diagnostic algorithm for HP um, from this uh, Blue Journal 2012 paper. Uh, basically, if you've got clinical findings of ILD, you have an HRCT, if it's atypical, without antigen exposure or specific antibodies, you can go onto a BAL. You don't have a lymphocytosis. We're not totally sure what you have. Go on to a surgical lung biopsy. Um, but if you have an antigen exposure and a lymphocytosis and a typical HRCT, you can be pretty confident in the diagnosis. Um, so what I'm leading to in here and highlighting is the challenge in diagnosing chronic HP. And I think, you know, in, when you're... I think it, Matt, it seems to be sort of more of a pressing issue now. Um, I, I get the sense that a long, t you know, a while ago, before there were treatments specific for IPF, or um, that it was not entirely as clear if you differentiated chronic HP that looked like IPF from IPF, did it really make a clinical difference? Did they have the same prognosis? You didn't have any treatment options. But now when I'm seeing patients in clinic, and I don't know if they have chronic HP or IPF, it's a big decision to try to, am I gonna put them on Intetinib or Esbriet? Or am I going to put them on immunosuppression and try to find an antigen? So it's really difficult to differentiate those two groups of people. Um, and so what we uh, did uh, was we, our objective of this study was to drive and validate a clinically applicable diagnostic model for the diagnosis of chronic HP in the absence of surgical lung biopsy. So this is um, a retrospective study. It's a case control study, so one HP for two controls, non-HP ILD controls. And they were taken from the longitudinal ILD database at UCSF over a six-year period. So all HP cases had a surgical lung biopsy and a multidisciplinary evaluation. Um, all non-HP controls were diagnosed by multidisciplinary evaluation, and we excluded unclassifiable and people who ended up with a diagnosis of not ILD. We collected demographic data, a patient reported history of exposure, and they have one of these questionnaires that goes through like 60 different exposures. Um, so mostly things like birds, down, farming, swamp coolers. Um, they had baseline PFTs, and then the, the HRCT was scored blindly by a radiologist for the presence and severity of certain radiographic features that we thought would be important in HP. And then uh, the HRCT was also scored by the level, the radiologist's confidence in the diagnosis. So he would sit there, and if he thought somebody had, uh, it was like a UIP pattern of IPF, he'd be confident in that. And then if they thought it was HP, they'd say, well, I've got moderate confidence in that, so that, for example. So the derivation cohort had 124 patients, and then it was validated in a smaller cohort of 66. Um, things that were significant on univariate analysis went into the potential model. And then basically these candidate models all of the variables are put together, and then the computer program combines everything and finds a, a C statistic, which is a measure of discrimination that says, if I have two people, one who has the disease and one doesn't, um, how, many t how accurate will I be in predicting if they have the disease or they don't? Um, we wanted to find a model that had a specificity of greater than 91%. That's basically what's been done in the IPF literature and has been fairly successful. Um, and that had face validity. That was something that you could take home and be like, okay, this is something I can apply to my patient with reasonable um, ease. So what we found, um, so the, for model one, um, where this was based on individual radiographic features that were scored on the HRCT, uh, we found that the important variables um, were age, uh, typically middle age, it's almost like a, uh, if you're younger, you're more likely to have a CTD. If you're older, you're more likely to have IPF. So if you're sort of in that middle range. If you had a history of down or bird exposure, if you had diffuse ground glass opacities and mosaic perfusion, that was highly predictive of a diagnosis of CT in all comers. Um, if you had age, the, the correct age, down birds, and then the an expert chest radiologist had a moderate to high confidence that it looks like this looks like HP, um, that it also had very good performance characteristics. Um, so again, these are weighted variables. You don't have to have all of those things. Um, you can still actually have a very high specificity if you have the right age and a characteristic CT. You don't need the exposure um, for a confident diagnosis. And we don't incorporate BAL or precipitins or inhalational challenge because they're not routinely performed there. Um, it's single center and it should be validated. Well, but 
I think this is hopefully something that could be built on if it ever gets if it gets published. Um, this can be something that can be built on with additional variables like BAL or inhalational challenge um, to determine whether or not those add to the performance characteristics of the model. Because when you're facing these patients, I'm finding that nobody actually wants to go for a surgical lung biopsy. So at the end of the day. I'm not always sure what people have, but if I could use some sort of predictive model, I could say with a certain degree of confidence that I think you have this. Um, and then they wouldn't need to go on to surgical lung biopsy. So I'm just gonna touch on this briefly, um, but maybe it might be part of the challenge with HP is with these classifications. Um, so we've had acute, subacute, chronic, active, residual, all these different types of classifications that uh, potentially just they describe the clinical behavior of the patients. Um, this group uh, did a cluster analysis of the HP study cohort. So they basically broke them down into two clusters and looked at the variables that um, put one category of as far away from the other category uh, statistically as possible and found that there was this cluster one that had recurrent symptoms, chest tightness, crackles, and a normal chest X-ray um, somewhat commonly, and that cluster two sounded more uh, like chronic um, findings. And when they tested, so. So the, so the old acute, subacute, and chronic, when they took the clusters, their new clusters were more, definitely uh, went with acute, but also involved some subacute. Um, but the cluster two was much more of a chronic um, group. And so I think this whole acute, subacute, chronic, while we like that in medicine, I think we apply that in lots of different approaches to things, may not be describing the underlying pathophysiology, what's going on with our patients. So yeah, in conclusion, there's no universally accepted diagnostic criteria. Again, I find this, um, I just keep saying it, don't I? It's common to have an unidentified antigen in the chronic forms. These prior prediction rules um, provide a probability of disease in the acute, subacute forms, and I think we really need to develop uh, clinically applicable prediction models for chronic HP. And I'd just like to thank my mentors at UCSF uh, for that project and helping me work through it. Thank you.